Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to extend my thanks to Johanna and the organizing committee for this opportunity to participate in this exciting event here at Elon University today. During the course of the discussion today, I'd like to walk you on a journey from the beginning of what showed up as a mysterious illness in otherwise healthy young men in 1981 uh, through the discovery of the HIV virus that causes the disease we call AIDS and some advances that have happened in the ability to treat the infection and that have changed the course of the epidemic globally as well as on the individual level. So, has HIV still an issue? Yes, indeed it is. In fact, you'll see from this graphic, from data from the World Health Organization, that these are some of the most common infectious diseases uh, that occur each year globally. And you'll notice that though millions of people are infected by HIV, malaria, or TB, or suffer severe illnesses with influenza on, on a seasonal flu outbreak, You'll notice the number of deaths in the millions, and HIV is the leading cause of infectious disease-related death globally uh, to this day. If we dig a little deeper into the, the numbers around the HIV infection, you'll notice that more than 35 million people are currently living with HIV today, globally. Uh, every year, uh, last year, well, in 2012, uh, more than 2 million people were newly infected and there were uh, just over one and a half million deaths attributed to the disease caused by HIV infection. You also note here that obviously uh, the biggest burden of the disease is in the sub-Saharan Africa region where the majority of uh, people living with HIV uh, are located. But you'll also note that in other regions such as I've shown here for North America and Western and Central Europe, there is still a significant population of people who are infected with HIV and subsequently succumb to the disease and uh, death by AIDS. To date, more than 36 million people have been killed uh, as a result of infection by HIV. These are statistics that at least we know of, cases that we know of. And one of the things I'll, we'll be talking a little more in detail about is how advances in the treatment of HIV disease have changed the, the trajectory of this type of data and this curve on a global level, but also I will not be talking today about vaccines or HIV pre prevention methods or socio-political issues related to the treatment uh, of the disease. Those are uh, topics in and of themselves that could be addressed by someone else at a different time. So just to be clear, HIV is the human immune deficiency virus, and this is a virus that's called a retrovirus because of how it works. It infects a type of white blood cell called a CD4 cell, and over time, these cells die off as a result of the infection, which leads to the clinical syndrome called AIDS, or the Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. And this is really the final stage of disease as a result of the infection. So just a little background to help you understand conceptually what we're speaking of. So the red uh, little virus here, uh, is HIV, and, and viruses can't grow on their own or replicate, so they have to infect a cell, and then they use the, shell, the cell as their factory, if you will, to produce uh, new viruses. So HIV infects a CD4 cell, there shown in the light yellow color, and then it becomes an HIV-infected cell, and the, the genomic material of HIV gets into the, the DNA of the cell, of the person's cell, and then that cell becomes a factory, untreated, uh, a cell can produce more than 10 billion viruses in a given day. So the cell uh, produces viruses, the viruses spread throughout the system, other cells become infected, the infection spreads further, additional cells become infected, and to the point where cells are starting to die off. Now again, these cells are important cells in your immune system because their role is to be like the conductor of an orchestra or the general of an army, where they coordinate the immune response to different pathogens or even tumors. And as I mentioned early on in 1981, there were cases of otherwise healthy individuals that were showing up with these severe immune deficiencies that led to rapid death. Interestingly, the first point of innovation, if you will, showed up with the advent of the first drug to treat HIV infection called AZT. Now, AZT was initially evaluated for its ability to kill cancer cells in the test tube, uh, but subsequently, scientists at Burroughs Welcome, located in Research Triangle Park, just down the road from here, uh, those individuals identified that HIV in the test tube was able to stop HIV from growing. 
And then uh, following clinical studies in the early 1980s, it led to FDA approval on March 19, 1987 as the first treatment to uh, be used for HIV infection. From 1987 to 1996, seven additional agents were approved. Four of those worked by the same mechanism you'll see in the little black circles as AZT. But there are three other drugs that were approved but that worked by different mechanisms because scientists began to understand more of the differences in how the virus grew and how they could target the different steps of how the virus uh, worked. It became obvious that no one drug alone was going to be able to control the virus because the virus develops resistance very quickly. What resistance means is that the virus changes or it mutates in such a way that it can still grow in the presence of the drugs that are there and that the patient is taking. So interestingly, by 1996, there was an observation that if you combined three drugs together in a regimen as combination therapy, you could slow the growth of the virus help restore immune function, and change the course of the clinical disease. These are data from the Euroceta cohort that are representative of the dramatic changes that occurred here in the mid-1990s. And this was published in the Lancet Journal. And this is an adaptation of data that are presented in that uh, presentation. You'll note that as the percentage of patients in the, in the purple began to increase on time of those people receiving this combination therapy, which typically now we use the term highly active antiretroviral therapy, meaning highly active, it's very potent, and a retroviral, it's fighting HIV and, of course, therapy. And then you'll notice as the, the percentage of patients increased over time, especially to the middle of 1996 on combination therapy, the number of AIDS cases began to dr de decline dramatically, as well as it did the number of deaths uh, due to the disease. I have physician, I'm a PhD, not an MD, but my physician colleagues who have treated patients from the beginning of the epidemic could note the dramatic change in, in just the, even the uh, situation in the hospital wards where people were dying daily to the point where they were empty beds in the hospitals. This was a dramatic change in the face of the epidemic. Since then, several other compounds have been approved as new treatments for the uh, treatment of HIV infection, including, again, additional classes or different mechanisms as to how the, the drugs work to stop the virus. And this also includes to other advances in this field where two to three drugs were combined into the same pill, so it reduces the number of pills a patient would have to take every day. It also made the uh, ability to create other options for combinations should the patient develop resistance or should the patient have tolerability issues with certain medications that they needed to change. So where are we headed today at this point in time? So as we mentioned, you could be taking several individual pills. We had advances to the point where you could take one pill or two pills that have uh, the three drugs in combination. So one of the things that people are thinking about now is if you could initially control the virus with three drugs, for example, could you then back off down to two drugs? And then that way you reduce the number of drugs the person has to take, the time the drugs are in their body, and uh, also make it perhaps a little bit uh, financially more favorable for the patient and the healthcare system in this way. Early studies so far have shown that the current therapies that were evaluated were not robust enough to have the activity needed to protect uh, the patients uh, and to control the virus. However, these strategies are currently being explored in, in clinical trials, looking with some of the newer agents that have more potency and better tolerability. So keep in mind, HIV therapy is a daily treatment every day, religiously, the patient has to take their therapy Otherwise, the virus will develop resistance and the virus will reemerge, and then um, you have to change treatment or you could have progression in disease. So what are some other ways that people are looking at right now to possibly change the way that therapy is administered and that way to help change the course of disease? So you could have, again, single tablets or, or a single pill with multiple drugs or a combination of pills. But what if you could change it to so such a way that a, a person could take a, a, an injectable formulation or maybe a patch in such a way that maybe once a month or once every three months or even, even if it was once a week, they could take their medicines less frequently. Just think every day when the patient has to take their medicine, it's a reminder of their HIV status. If you could change the frequency 
with which someone needs to take their therapy, it could change even sort of the psychological uh, component of having to take the therapy every day. So these are things that are currently ongoing in studies between uh, collaboration with pharmaceutical companies, academic researchers, biotechnology companies, patient groups trying to understand how do we get there, how do we understand this. So highly active antiretroviral therapy, it works. We showed you that. It controls the virus. It changes the, f the course of disease for the patient. It changes the course of the epidemic by changing the number of people that, uh, that are that are dying, but as you saw, there's still significant disease burden globally and even in different regions. So is it possible to cure HIV infection? Before we go any further, let's ask that question, otherwise it's perhaps a waste of time. Well, one is certainly a lonely number, um, and there is one person, uh, one adult today that has been um, uh, reported as cured of HIV infection. His name is Mr. Timothy Brown. Uh, otherwise known as the Berlin patient, and um, he was, a, was an HIV-infected man. He's still alive, but he was HIV-infected, and he had acute myeloid leukemia and required uh, two bone marrow transplants to treat that disease uh, due to relapse. Interestingly, in his instance, following those transplants, um, he was free of the virus. Uh, many labs on many continents using very sensitive assays have not yet been able to detect HIV in his blood or the tissues that they've examined. And more importantly, perhaps as the sign of, of the cure, is that the, he's gone off of uh, HIV medicines and the virus, there's no growth of virus that is seen uh, for several years now. Recently, there was a report of the Mississippi baby, as it's called. It was an infant that was treated uh, at the time of birth in, in a sort of a unique way, let's say. And, um, but uh, we're trying to understand more uh, about this baby to understand what happened there. As you might imagine, you can't do as many um, uh, experiments or tests on infants as you could on an adult. But I think just the key thing to keep in mind is that in this case, there is at least the plausible uh, view that you could achieve an HIV infection. So this has re-energized the HIV uh, cure research field. So what does cure look like? Well, if it looks like the Berlin patient, so to speak, it looks like eradication. You can't detect HIV anywhere else in the body or, um, and you don't need therapy anymore. Otherwise, it could look more something like in the cancer field, the term remission, and we use the term functional cure in the HIV area, meaning that the patient might still be HIV positive. However, they can go off of therapy for an extended period of time without the clinical consequences of virus growth. So again, treatment controls growth, but it doesn't get rid of all the HIV-infected cells because HIV can hide, and the scientific term is latent. It can go latent, it can hide in, in the cells that it infects and be there for decades. Um, work from the Johns Hopkins University and the NIH and other groups have shown that if a patient uh, took their medicines every day, and they did this by studying groups of patients, and they monitored the change in the number of these hidden cells, if you will, over time, it would take more than 60 years for those cells to die off uh, on their own due to the normal biology of the infection. So how can we get rid of those cells without harming the, the patient, without hurting the other cells that aren't infected? How can we do that? Well, we want to turn on HIV, and we can do this by different approaches, but at the same time, we want to kill the cells that are now expressing HIV, but we always want to do this under the cover of antiretroviral therapy. We want to protect the uninfected cells so that we don't reseed the infection in the individual. So how do we do this? Well, in the lab, in the test tube, in the early phase, we use a combination at this point in time of uh, collaborations of virologists and immunologists looking at how we can tweak the immune system to work better, of oncology and epigenetics trying to understand changes in the DNA structure and in how genes are regulated so that we can find ways to turn on or turn off HIV in a very specific way, and then drug delivery specialists that can help us think about how do we direct the certain drug we want only to the infected cell and not to the other cells. And this could be important for reducing side effects or tolerability issues uh, for, for a given person. Now this is the roadmap to a cure. You'll notice that it's blank because we don't have a roadmap to a cure. We have a roadmap to how to develop a new medicine to control HIV, but we don't know really what it's going to look like to get to the point 
to cure HIV. So therefore, what we do is we have a big conglomeration of different groups coming together, industry, academics, government groups, non-government organizations, regulatory, the FDA, the, the EMA from Europe, uh, healthcare providers, and of course, always the voice of the patient, the patient being involved and helping us understand what's going on, how we can work together. And so there's three large initiatives that I would just highlight for you. One is the NIH has funded uh, what's called the Martin Delaney Collaboratory, which was named after an AIDS activist that died in 2009. He, um, he was someone that uh, really spearheaded um, the interest in this area. And um, three uh, groups were awarded um, funding by the NIH. Both uh, university and industry partners are required at each site, so there's multi-groups working together there. The International AIDS Society has a focus called Towards an HIV Cure, and they're working together with industry partners and the same groups of people, and I'm on one of those committees, and we meet uh, several times a year to see how we can work better and work together to go forward. And then the HIV Forum for Collaborative Research coordinates the same types of meetings where we get together and we try to define more clearly what is the path to a cure for HIV. How do we study it in the clinic with new drugs and old drugs and drugs from different areas? So I leave you with the red ribbon. The red ribbon is a reminder. It's the ribbon for HIV and AIDS to raise awareness and support for those affected by the disease and living with the, uh, the disease. In the course of this TEDx event today, in North America, 16 people will have become infected with HIV. Seven people will have died from the events of AIDS just in North America alone during the course of this time today. We need to advance the, the treatment so it's easier for patients to take the medicines and they can avoid the sequelae evolved with uh, resistance and other factors. We're trying to understand that cure is not a four-letter word anymore, uh, but we are trying to understand how do we get there? How do we work together? And partnerships, public and private groups, are essential to, to pulling this off. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and um, I just uh, appreciate the chance to be here today. Thank you.